In this tutorial, we're going to look at the combustion of fuel. So the first aim is describe the properties of a good fuel, and then B, compare the processes of complete and incomplete combustion, and then explain how we can reduce the levels of atmospheric pollution as a result of combusting fuels. The discovery of fire by early humans forever changed the way we live. Fire obviously has some obvious uses like keeping us warm, cooking food, but if you also think about it, fire was in a way a bit like the first television set. Early humans would gather around in their caves at night, around fire, socialising, exchanging stories, and just generally staring into its hypnotic glow, much like modern families do around a TV. Fire made it possible for humans to remain active after the sun went down. But in today's human world, we use fire largely as a source of energy. For a fire to exist, we need a bit of heat, we need oxygen, and of course, a fuel. And boy, do we like burning fuels. Now, you're probably aware that burning fuels has had an impact on our environment, but there are certain things we look for that make a fuel more preferable than others. So here are four quick properties to consider. Firstly, ease of ignition. How easily does it burn? For example, wood and coal are harder to burn than something like gas from your cooker. Secondly, Energy value. Obviously, we want the fuel that produces the most energy. Thirdly, the amount of ash and smoke produced. We really want a fuel that burns cleanly, so it has lowest impact on the environment. And lastly, storage and transport. How easy are these fuels to store and transport from one place to another? You see, coal is quite easy to store and transport, but if it gets damp during transport, it's ruined. Whereas gases take up more space, it's easier for them to leak out, so they can be a bit more tricky to transport. Also, because gases catch fire quicker, um, they're more risky in terms of fire hazards. So let's take a look at footage of a fuel burning. Here we have ethanol gas in a plastic bottle. I'm setting fire to it. Now you can see it caught fire very quickly, so it burns very easily. Ease of ignition is high. A lot of energy was released, you can see, so it got very hot very quickly. There was a blue flame, that implies that it was a very hot flame. Um, also, the fact that we had a blue flame being produced indicates that it burns cleanly, so we're not going to get a lot of ash and smoke from this fuel. But as you can see, it's a gas, so it would require a larger storage container than something like a solid fuel. So what I've just done is I've evaluated the desirability of using this fuel. Something like coal would be harder to ignite. It would produce more uh, energy because it will burn for longer. It will produce ash and smoke as well, so it doesn't burn as cleanly as this ethanol gas. And it would be easier to store. So basically you have to weigh up the pros and cons for every fuel. So that's how we describe the properties of a good fuel. So now we're going to compare the processes of complete and incomplete combustion, two ways in which we burn a fuel. We are always aiming for complete combustion, but sometimes incomplete combustion occurs. So complete combustion occurs when we burn a hydrocarbon fuel, if you remember any molecule made from just hydrogen and carbon, such as methane, in excess oxygen. So in other words, there's plenty of oxygen to break down the fuel. So in other words, hydrogen and carbon can fully react with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water, as well as lots of energy. I write energy in brackets because it's not a physical thing you can touch, it's just energy. So I've actually balanced this in the balancing equations lesson, so I'm not going to repeat that in as much detail. But basically, you'd heat up the methane with the oxygen. That would cause the bonds to break between the reacting molecules, so now they can recombine in a new way to form the products. Hydrogen, being more reactive than carbon, will latch on to the oxygen first before the carbon has a chance. That will form water. So you can see here I've produced two molecules of water. The carbon now left over will bond with the remaining oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. This is what we expect to get from a complete combustion reaction. Here, carbon and hydrogen have been fully oxidised. They've reacted with as much oxygen as they can. You can test complete combustion really easily in a lab. You just need a Bunsen burner and a white clay pot fragment. To test complete combustion, you must have the Bunsen valve open so plenty of oxygen can get in. So it works like this. Valve open you heat 
the Bunsen, you can see a blue flame and you're putting the clay pot above. Now what you'll notice is there's no change in its color. Now this will only really make sense when we compare it to incomplete combustion, so just wait until we get there. One thing you should be aware of, that even though we're hoping to get carbon dioxide and water vapour, they too have an impact on the environment. They are greenhouse gases. What that means is, is they surround our planet as part of our atmosphere, and there they can trap some of the heat from the sun. So the sun emits UV radiation, which basically enters our atmosphere and is absorbed by Earth then the Earth re-emits it as longer wavelength infrared radiation, which gets absorbed by these greenhouse gases. Now, these greenhouse gases will re-radiate this radiation in all directions, but including back to Earth, which is why we get warmer, and it's contributing to this problem of climate change or global warming. Now, of course, it's important we do have greenhouse gases. Without it, we would be absolutely freezing as a planet, and life would not sustain itself. But human activity is tipping the balance, and now it's getting too hot for certain forms of life to exist. And perhaps if we continue, we could even say all life to exist. So remember, greenhouse gases absorb solar radiation, or heat, and then re-radiate it, that means emit it, in all directions, including back to Earth. So what happens in incomplete combustion? Well, first we must identify the problem. We again burn a hydrocarbon fuel, but this time in a limited supply of oxygen. In other words, there isn't enough oxygen to give carbon and hydrogen what they want and need. So we will produce some carbon dioxide and some water, but we'll also produce carbon and the very poisonous gas carbon monoxide. Plus, we'll also get energy, but less energy. So there are a number of ways you can write the incomplete combustion equation in terms of chemical symbol equation. Here is just one of those ways. So I have four molecules of methane, six molecules of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and eight molecules of water are formed, but also carbon, which will appear as black sooty marks, and carbon monoxide, two molecules of carbon monoxide gas. In fact, about 40 people every year in the UK die from carbon monoxide poisoning because of a faulty boiler. So it's always worth checking if um, your boiler contains black sooty marks around it because that will imply there's not enough oxygen getting to it and your boiler could be producing the silent killer gas carbon monoxide. If you remember from B1, carbon monoxide bonds with haemoglobin in red blood cells and prevents your red blood cell from carrying oxygen. So now let's have a look at incomplete combustion. Here you'll notice that the Bunsen burner valve is closed, so I am limiting the amount of oxygen that can get inside. Let's see what happens to that clay pot fragment now. So the valve's closed. As you can see, it's an orange flame, not blue, not hot enough, not enough oxygen. And look at the white clay pot fragment. You can see it's black, except for where my tongs were holding it. That's soot or carbon being produced. So let's just summarise the differences between complete and incomplete combustion because it could quite easily be a six marker in an exam paper. They often quite like testing you on your knowledge to describe the harmful effects the products of both complete and incomplete combustion can have. So first you remember complete burns with enough oxygen, incomplete combustion the fuel does not burn with enough oxygen. If you also remember, the flame is blue with complete combustion, but with incomplete, it's orange flame and you get soot being produced. In complete combustion, hydrogen and carbon are fully oxidised. In incomplete combustion, carbon is not fully oxidised. Complete combustion produces more energy, whereas incomplete combustion produces less energy. Complete combustion produces greenhouse gases, which can increase global temperature by trapping more solar radiation. And incomplete combustion can do that, but also produce carbon, which creates soot, which makes things look dirty. And it can also produce the lethal gas, carbon monoxide. It's colourless, it's odourless, and it basically stops you from transporting oxygen to your cells so you can live. So that is how you compare the processes of complete and incomplete combustion. Let's look at some other issues with burning fuels. Some fuels contain sulfur, that yellow element that makes egg yolk look the way it does, and smell the way it does as well. When you burn sulfur, it produces sulfur dioxide as the sulfur reacts with oxygen. So here you can see coal with little specks of sulfur, and as you're burning it, the sulfur is reacting with oxygen to produce sulfur dioxide. And sulfur dioxide, when it basically reacts with water, produces acid rain. So when it reacts with the water in the atmosphere, it produces acid rain. 
Now, acid rain causes all sorts of problems. It basically kills trees, it strips the leaves off trees, it lowers the pH in lakes and kills pond life and water life, marine life in general, fish, plants, all sorts. And it can also damage constructions made from limestone, such as graves and buildings. There are some solutions to this, though. We can remove sulphur from fuels, but that costs quite a lot of money. Um, we can use acid gas scrubbers. These are devices made from calcium carbonate which are placed on top of power station chimneys and if you remember calcium carbonate is a base so as the acidic gases rise they get neutralised by calcium carbonate. That question comes up a lot in exams so be aware that we can use calcium carbonate to neutralise acidic gases in power stations. Also, we can use catalytic converters in cars, which I won't go into a lot of detail here how they work, but they can clean up exhaust gases as well. As well as sulfur dioxide, we're also increasing the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through deforestation. That means cutting down trees. So if we're cutting down trees, there's less carbon dioxide taken in through the process of photosynthesis. So when trees die, the carbon they've taken in through photosynthesis remains in their wood, locked up. But microbes such as fungi can break the wood down, releasing this locked up carbon back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Also, when we burn trees, we release that locked up carbon back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So remember, carbon dioxide is taken in through photosynthesis, but when we burn it, we release it back into the atmosphere. This is why it's very important to recycle paper. There are some pretty clever solutions to this carbon dioxide problem. The first one is called iron seeding. This is when we put iron in the upper ocean, like so. And then microscopic plants called phytoplankton use it for photosynthesis and as a result grow in number. Now, just like any plant, they remove carbon dioxide through the process of photosynthesis. So carbon dioxide will be absorbed by this phytoplankton. Very clever, but not perfect. Unfortunately, some phytoplankton are toxic, and if you remember the biology lesson on eutrophication, or rather pollution, if these phytoplankton die, they decompose, and bacteria will use up oxygen in the process, creating a dead zone where no life can live. So it's quite a gamble. Lastly, we can convert carbon dioxide actually back into hydrocarbon fuels. This sounds amazing, but it requires high pressure, high temperature, and a metal catalyst. Now obviously, where does this heat come from? It comes from burning or using fuels, so for this to work, we really need to use a green source of energy, such as a renewable source, like wind energy, solar energy, something like that. It's also very hard to produce long-chain hydrocarbons, like petrol, which we use frequently. So this certainly has a limited use. Here you can see I've just shown a molecule of carbon dioxide and what we're doing is turning it into back into hydrocarbons. And that's how we can explain how to reduce the levels of atmospheric pollution.